You're listening to Experience Imagination, a themed entertainment design podcast presented by Falcons Creative Group. Every episode, we discuss a new topic with a panel of creative professionals. Hi, I'm Cecil McPurry, President and Chief Creative Officer of Falcons. Welcome to this episode of Experience Imagination. I'm your host, Audrey DeLong. Falcons Beyond and Academy Award-winning Braun Studios just announced a partnership to co-develop and co-produce multiple IPs, including Kathmandu, which began its life as a theme park and will soon be the focus of an animated TV series. Braun and Falcons will give a host of other IPs the transmedia treatment as well. On today's podcast, we're going to speak with Jason Chen, Executive Vice President of Digital at Braun Studios. Among the topics we'll discuss, Web3, utilizing Epic Games' Unreal Engine to produce animation, and how the entertainment industry is embracing NFTs. First, though, let's bring in Jason Ambler, President of Falcons Digital Media, and Saham Ali, Vice President of Technology. So, Jason, give us a little background on our partnership with Braun and how we'll be working with them. We started talking with Braun originally as a potential service provider for a studio to help produce some of our long-form content initiatives that we were rolling out here in the near future. And uh, early on in our conversations with them, it was just clear that we were hitting it off and that we really shared a lot of the same business philosophies and same ideals. And as we continued talking, it just became very evident to us that we are very complementary in what our expertise is and... um, through that process, have now formed a strategic partnership. That's great. Saham, could you briefly describe Web 3.0, or Web 3 as it's often called? Is anyone using it right now? Well, the short answer is no and yes. Uh, The reality is it's Web 3 in itself, this concept of a decentralized internet and, and content that's driven by content creators and ownership of that content is directly attributed to them, is kind of in the making, where Web 1, as we knew, was the initial uh, message boards, forums, and dial-up modems and getting to data. Web 2, that's where kind of where we're at now, right? Social media, user-driven content, but it's all hosted on giant corporation data servers, and they own everything effectively. And Web 3 is going to come eventually when a lot of these technologies that support it, things like Node.js and client-side rendering frameworks, will make it so that you will be able to publish content and that content doesn't necessarily reside on anyone's specific servers and it is tied to you maybe through a blockchain address of sorts. You know, it doesn't just go to publishing. Any data that you're carrying is essentially encrypted and also not owned your personal preferences. There's there's always a chain of custody. And people are still going to do the same thing. It's just the way you'll actually get it out there and the means of attribution to credits to you and sort of like a digital rights management, right? When you create a meme or a GIF or an audio track or a picture of any of those sorts and you publish it in the appropriate way in the world of Web3, it will be always known to have originated from you. I see. So what are some examples of Web3 applications? So dApps, as they're now called, decentralized apps, um, the idea being it is um, something that has to come from somewhere, right? Like you're going to hit a website, but rather than the functions of that app being processed on a website, they really run on your phone. And then the data itself that populates maybe fields and underlying data sets of that app will come from somewhere on the internet, but it's no longer centralized, let's say, on Google's or Facebook servers. It might be sitting in what they now term as the interplanetary file system, just a hole in the wall cloud that you don't know what computer where actually owns it, but the address on it says it's yours. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I keep reading like uh, Web3 is going to be safer. It's going to be better. What makes it better? Well, that's the argument. I don't know if anybody really knows if it's going to be better or worse. Or safer. Or safer. You know, there's a lot of concerns. You know, data privacy is going to be a big part of it. It's a very technical layer that it hasn't been candified for the mass consumption Mm. of everybody right now. That's right. Games, a lot of times, are innovators in kind of the way that technologies and things get rolled out when you think about, you know, network multiplayer games and things like that. But now we're talking about blockchain technology to 
have transfer of ownership in certain quantities. And when you think about these games where collectability and value is held within these different assets, that value now can be shared and traded just like anything else. I think that's really where we're going to see probably the biggest application of Web3 technology is going to be starting with games, and then it's going to proceed to expand into our everyday life, how we interact with the world, how we make purchases, or even they're talking about ID cards and things like that, that you can now mm -hmm. use things like MetaMask and other tools your wallet, certainly, too. Or how we experience attractions at theme parks or LBEs <laughs> or museums. So yeah. let's talk about how Falcons might use it. Yeah, so, you know, in the themed entertainment context, again, I think it kind of falls into the same category as games where theme parks and attractions are also very much innovators, uh, leveraging new technology, new applications that are not for um, necessarily a mass consumer market like consumer electronics. They're creating very bespoke technology for a specific use case, which can then further the technology and, and how you experience it. It expands and democratizes the value for the fans and for the participants. All interfaces, all transactions will be, in a sense, recorded. Every interaction that you do, and therefore, supplemental technologies, machine learning, AI, your next experience is different. It is dynamic. You will be engaged in different ways because the system has evolved. And as Jason always likes to mention, the concept of persistence, mm -hmm. right? It's not like a one and done. The That's idea right. is your identity in this Web3 new world will be a persistent identity, which you can re-engage, but it's dynamic. So ultimately, it will make the guest experience better when they go to theme parks, for example. Yeah, I think right. it's going to expand it. And also, in the way we're leveraging some Web3 technology is seeing beyond the four walls, so to speak, of the venues or the parks themselves. And mm -hmm. how do we extend this beyond and create a larger engagement for fandom to share and spread and connect and trade and do all the things that they want to do. There's ways now you can read that data at a park level and then pull the data from your wallet or from your collection and use that then to generate content. So that's, again, kind of personalizing the experience based off of what you know is considered owned assets. It's going to be interesting. There's going to be a challenge when this ownership concept comes as creators are going to have to respect the little bit of accessibility to their content that's now somebody else's. And they can make modified versions of it or change things. And they might have something in their smart contract that says they get a 1%, but they have now allowed that right to pass to the next person. One of the interesting things about kind of digital rights ownership is that there are more utilities that are opening up. These utilities can extend to, you know, pre-screenings of a movie it can kind of give you VIP access. It could give you exclusive access, not just to events, but also to content and how it rolls out or even products. So when we think about rewarding loyalty, it's another layer that when applied to entertainment, you can look at that through that lens and say, wow, you know, you are part of this loyal group. You get special privileges when relating to that brand or IP. But by having a chain of custody and these digital rights now, you can reward the people that are participating in your entertainment ecosystem. The value that you're putting on these digital assets is really immeasurable in how far that can go. All right, thanks for that introduction to this very interesting topic. Yeah, you're welcome. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Welcome to the podcast, Jason Chen, Executive Vice President of Digital at Braun Studios. Hello, hello. Pleasure to uh, be a part of this. This is awesome. It's awesome to have you. Um, I, you know, I don't want to jump right to the topic because, you know, I, I want to learn about your background. We like to do this, you know, so all of our guests get a, get a good sense of where you came from. I know you have a lot of experience working in visual effects and virtual production as well on films like Jojo Rabbit, Ant-Man, Star Trek Into Darkness, Thor Ragnarok, and a little film called Avatar. I think that <laughs> did pretty well. Um, yes. You also worked uh, as a visual effects supervisor on two of my personal favorite comedies, uh, HBO comedies, Veep and Curb Your Enthusiasm. First of all, I'm kind of curious what you did on those live action shows. A lot of people don't think of visual effects when they think of those kinds of comedies. 
Absolutely. I mean, look, I think everything these days actually has some form of visual effects in them. And what we were, what we call it is uh, we really focus in on invisible visual effects. So for example, in Veep, um, the very last episode, spoiler alert for those that are uh, rewatching Veep or watching it for the first time, fantastic show is that at the convention center, all of that was crowd replacement. I mean, when we shot it on the day, we only had about 50 to 75 uh, extras in the crowd. So everything in there that you saw, we populated that entire convention hall. Same goes with the certain things in um, Curb. It's really crowd replications, uh, making sure that some of the buildings to either paint out logos or get rid of distracting trees or anything like that. But uh, a lot of the gags to in Curb, for example, like the tomato seed squirting on the painting, uh, that was enhanced by visual effects. Um, so right. especially with Veep, as the season progressed, it was uh, more and more VFX heavy <laughs> as we right. continued. Yeah. Nice. I love those shows. Yeah. Uh, so how did your past roles, especially in the films, prepare you for what you're doing now at Braun? And, and tell us what you do. What does your day to day look like? Yeah. So um, I am the executive vice president of the digital group at uh, Braun Studios. And essentially, I started at a very early age with a passion for visual effects. I saw Jurassic Park as a kid and just was enamored with industrial light and magic. Visual effects has been ingrained in me from an early onset. And uh, my mother saw that and sent me to a few summer courses that are full immersion filmmaking courses. And uh, we actually had the opportunity to shoot on the Universal Backlot through the New York Film Academy. And uh, on one of my short films, one of the actresses that I got really got along with, she had already been in the business. And she said, hey, I know you're in your uh, junior year of high school. So but for the summer, we're looking for someone to kind of do everything, you know, get coffee, paint fire lanes on this stage on a small production. Uh, I go down there and lo and behold, it was the original Tintin camera test with Spielberg and Peter Jackson. And it kind of progressed in that sense. Um, we continued to go on with the test and it just so happened that we were working on the same stages as Avatar and motion capture. And at that time, mocap was such a, a revolutionary piece of technology. So really, it was such a fascinating thing for me to see as someone one that's just coming in the industry. And then fast forward, you know, I was started taking care of the Weta Digital people as just a production assistant. The test ended and uh, Weta offered me a role as uh, to go on this little show called Project 880 at the time. And that was uh, Avatar. Uh, the original contract was for about six months. Six months turned into uh, a year. A year turned into two. Two turned into four. And by the end of the stint in Avatar, I was running the digital continuity department. So fast forward uh, after that, continued the journey in virtual production, working on a show called Real Steel, and then spent a few years with the Bad Robot camp and Star Trek Into Darkness and Star Wars Force Awakens, and then found myself at a small company called Marvel Studios. <laughs> uh, <laughs> All those lessons from building open worlds in Avatar to, you know, really seeing how universes are built out through the Marvel camp, um, it kind of has just culminated in this job that I have now. <laughs> so um, I met Aaron and Brenda. And if for those of you that don't know, Braun actually stands for Brenda and Aaron combined. Um, so that's our CEO and president, uh, husband and wife team that have grown this company from the ground up you know, for coming up on 11 years now. One of the big things is that they really had foresight for the future. And, um, you know, I was a VFX supervisor on one of their shows called uh, Those Who Wish Me Dead. And uh, we just started talking about all the, the slow process that animation is as a whole today and how it needs to change for the future and really bringing Unreal Engine into the forefront of that and how we can expedite and really bring our TV and feature timelines into the animation space. So long story short, that's where we are today. And that's how what we've been doing for the past two and a half years. That is a very rich background to draw from for, <laughs> for your position now. And I can see why you are in that position right now. So I want to go back to one point you made. You were talking uh, to, to Aaron and team at Braun about how to change the animation process. What was wrong with it? And what are you guys doing differently now? 
There's nothing wrong with it. I just think if we look at timelines, we did a fantastic project with a very talented team at Brown Animation called the Willoughbys. And as as really proud of we are as a project, it took four years, 200 people on staff. So it's just the way that I put it and the way that Aaron puts it uh, is that, you know, it's a long time to wait to go to bat once. Mm. And in comparison with our traditional TV projects and feature film projects in that same span of time we've done 60 70 even 80 projects at various stages of production development um, either co-financing or producing ourselves so in comparison it's like sometimes you can wait up to 24 hours to render one frame of an animation show uh using the game engine you're rendering 24 frames a second so just Think about those metrics in comparison to how they relate to production uh, and schedule and and just the kind of sheer quantity that we can put out uh, and iterations we can put out. The creative process has never been so transparent because there's so much room now for iterations and really honing in and finessing and getting to the fun parts of the process where it's putting cuts together, putting emotional ties in, really honing in that character so we can make them um, stick out amongst others. Definitely cutting edge technology is used. <laughs> I can see that. And it's a, such a collaborative process. It's, it's so awesome to, to see it all come together. Another new technology, and as we learned in the intro, it's not quite out there yet, is Web3. So I want to shift gears and talk about that a little bit. How do you think Braun is going to leverage Web3's capabilities? It's super interesting because the fact that we chose Unreal from the early onset, and it is by nature a uh, gaming engine, So when we started this division, we wanted to make it very much um, from the early development stage that we knew we were going to create a series, but we also knew that we were going to create an immersive world and gaming experience. So uh, at that time, we just wanted to create a game and content at the same time. And over the past two years and the spike in interest in Web3, it kind of has put us in a very interesting but proactive position where we have all the assets, we have games in development, and we've designed our projects uh, from script form to be fully immersive, integrated, and expanded. So um, it's been such an interesting journey because we're having literally hourly conversations on all the environments we've already created and how we're leveraging that to uh, put it out in the world because audiences want more. You know, it's not just 2D content that'll cut it anymore. They want to be fully immersed. They want to be really involved in the story. And I think that's where the Web3 community is is so important in this day and age. It's really democratization of just not technology, but it's also democratization of ideas and what communities want on a global scale. Because look, we're in an artistic medium, right? We create content for a living. And one of the things that we do really well here at Braun is make sure that everyone's opinion matters uh, because we're putting it out into the world and not just one opinion counts. We very much are excited about the future and how things are going to continue to change and expand out into interactive experiences, but also tying in narrative and story uh, into those experiences as a whole. You know, one of the things that struck me as interesting when I was doing the research um, for this segment was you have a collaboration, Braun does, with a company called XYZZY. And they're a gaming, NFT, and metaverse studio. What are you guys working on with them? That group in particular, and then we also have a group that we're working with called DIG, uh, Decentralized Investment Group. They're very much a part of our Web3 strategy and rollout. So what they're doing is we're working at an early standpoint um, to really immerse them into all the IP that we've created so that they can be that translation into the Web3 community and space. Because in the Web3 space, we all know that community is key. Um, So really making sure that, A, our IP is looked after, but also that we have a smooth transition into the Web3 space that is respectful to the community and also listening to the community as well. So that partnership there is very much a part of our game plan moving forward in the gaming space as well. That's a smart strategy, I got to tell you. All right, well, let's talk about Ron and Falcons uh, now that we're working together to... (laughs) 
co-develop and co-produce multiple IPs. Tell us about um, your feelings about that collaboration. And and after that, I want to hear about how Web3 might play a role in it. First and foremost, you know, working with the teams and and just spending a pretty good amount of time with Cecil and Jason and and the group. It's just they're such a forward thinking company, uh, Falcons. And there's a lot of similarities in terms of where Bronze Story began and where Falcons began. For example, my first conversation with Jason Ambler, it was supposed to be just a quick Hey, how are you doing? And it turned out to be a hour and a half to two hour conversation just about everything from visual effects to animation to the future to current markets, much like what we're talking about right now. And it's so rare that you find a team that really get it and have the same standards of quality that they want to put out in the world. Because sometimes in this space, there's a lot of content that needs to be pushed out there. And sometimes it doesn't hit the quality bar. And what we really want to focus on, and the great thing is that so does the whole Falcons team, is really putting out high-end quality projects, whether it's animation, whether it's an NFT, whether it's a game. It needs to be the best because uh, you only have one chance to make a first impression when it comes to IP and Falcons and the Braun team see very much eye to eye on that. So yeah, I'm so excited as, uh, as we continue forward and I can only imagine where this is going to go in the next, uh, you know, couple weeks to six months to even five years, 10 years. It's really hard to see the future, obviously, but but some people have been really good at gauging where technology is going to go. I feel like Falcons and Braun are two companies that do that really well. And that, that was really well put, Jason. So kind of the sky is the limit. It's just the only limit is imagination. Uh, where do you see uh, Web3 taking us together? In terms of the Braun and Falcons relationship, I think because Falcons also has physical spaces and attractions, that just opens up the ballpark even more just early thoughts about how you can tie certain things in from the gaming's uh, perspective and then actually see it in a physical space and pay it off. I think that is the future. It's going to be a mixture of both. That's awesome. All right, Jason. Well, best of luck with your ongoing endeavors at Braun. And really, from all of us at Falcons, we look forward to creating fantastic content together. Um, It's going to be so great. Um, And thanks for being with us today. Absolutely. This, I'm sure, will be the first of many. All right, that wraps up another episode of Experience Imagination. I'd like to thank our guests, Jason Ambler, Saham Ali, and special guest Jason Chen. Please join us again next time for another episode of Experience Imagination. Thank you for listening to Experience Imagination, a Falcons Creative Group production. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the podcast and share with your friends. To keep up with our latest news, visit us on the web at falconscreativegroup.com and follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you have any questions, comments, or ideas for future episodes, please email us at podcast at falconscreativegroup.com.